By way of introduction, my name is Susan Roylance. I'm currently the president of the United Families of Utah organization in the state of Utah. I have previously been the national vice president of United Families of America. And to let you know that I have been involved in politics for a long time, I was also a congressional candidate in Washington State prior to my moving to Utah. I have cared deeply about my country for many, many years. In fact, my involvement in politics began back at the time of the Vietnam War. I read of the sending of our young men to war, and I did not feel at that time, although I could not be described as a person who was a Vietnam demonstrator, I was concerned that there was not the appropriate government involvement to protect the lives of our young men. And at, at that time, I was of the same age as of those young men that were being sent to war. And so I wrote a letter to the editor. And uh, as, I, as the emotions of the situation welled up within me, and I put my feelings into word, that letter to the editor began my involvement in politics. I was called and invited to come to a meeting, and one thing led to another. And from that time on, I have been involved in trying to help make our country a good place to live and to do my part to protect the freedoms that I feel are critical and important in a free society. And one thing that has been a creed of mine is I believe that as long as we have a free society, we are each individually responsible for the decisions of our government. If we do not like what our government is doing, we basically are responsible if we have not raised our voice. However, if we have done all that we can do, if we have let our, our leaders know how we feel and we have done all that we can do, then I believe that we will not be held accountable before our God, but we can go before him and say that we did the best that we could do. Now, today I'm bringing you a very serious concern, and I want to tell you from the outside, outset, time is short. If we do not do something in the next hour, day, and at the very most week, we will very likely lose some of the religious liberties which we have in the state of Utah. I do not want to stand before my God someday and say that in Utah, we decided to remove God from our public meetings, from our schools, any reference to God. God was not invited in the state of Utah in 1992. And the people were comfortable enough with the situation that they would allow those who wanted to remove God to prevail. I want to give you some background as to where we are today and why we are where we are. Yeah, but first I'd like to go all the way back to the crossing of the ocean by the Mayflower. One of my ancestors was William Brewster. And as many of you know, he was the religious leader on the Mayflower. He came to this country for religious freedom. There were people who died on that boat. There were people who died after they arrived because it was very difficult to have enough food and the provisions that were necessary. But some did survive. And because of that, we have this great nation that we all have the opportunity of living in today and a great constitution which does allow for religious freedom to the extent that it has been interpreted to do so, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Then I also had ancestors who crossed the plains, the plains of Kansas and Nebraska, to the state of Utah. And at the time that they came to the state of Utah, Utah was considered no man's land. No one really wanted to live in Utah. So they thought if they came to Utah, they could practice their religion as they chose without interference. That they could worship their God as they saw fit. Now you need to know that in that process of becoming a state, there was a great deal of concern on the national level that there may be a constitution that could be established that would allow the Mormon church, which was the church at the time, who was the predominant church in the state of Utah, that would allow the Mormon church to, to take over the government and, and in, a, in essence establish a country of their own within the United States of America. And so there was a lot of, of opposition 
to even allowing Utah to become a state. In fact, it took six drafts of the Constitution to present it to Congress before it was accepted and Utah was allowed to become a state. And in the process of preparing those drafts, language was prepared that restricted religious freedom at, to the maximum extent possible to make sure that the Mormon church would be held in check in the state of Utah. Now interestingly enough, the Constitution was accepted, Utah became a state, and no one really paid too much attention to that language until a year ago, when all of a sudden uh, someone discovered that language and in light of recent decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court, they thought they had found a gold mine. They thought they had found the way to invite God to leave Utah. Excuse me. I want to now take you uh, back a little bit to some of the things that were happening at the same time on the national level. Probably the first thing that happened that uh, you and I might recognize as a, as a concern and as a, an indication that there are, were those in this country that would like to invite God to leave the United States of America occurred when the decision was made by the U.S. Supreme Court that prayers would not be allowed in public school. At the time, I, I can't say that I was overly concerned about that decision. I thought, well, school is a place where we teach children reading, writing, and arithmetic. and They can go to church to learn uh, about God and to pray to God, and, and maybe school is not the place for prayers anyway. However, we should keep in mind that for 200 years in this country, the children were taught their ABCs with an A and a B and a C, each representing a scripture from the Bible, so that those those people who founded our country and who established this great country were taught in their schools the basic principles of right and wrong right from the scriptures. And I do believe that ha that has a lot to do with why we have become the great country that we are today. But, but I have to be honest and say that it didn't concern me a great deal when the decision was made that prayer could no longer be said in public schools. A greater concern was probably expressed by the Baptists and many of the religions in the South. There's a very, very strong uh, concern about that decision in the Bible Belt of the South. And uh, through continually going back to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court finally did say that it was appropriate to have a moment of silence in school. A decision where five justices said a moment of silence was appropriate was handed down. Now all you need is five to get a, a majority opinion from the U.S. Supreme Court. So the state of Louisiana said, all right, if we can have a moment of silence in school, we'll pass a law in the state of Louisiana that allows a daily moment of silence. And in the process of passing that law, there was one legislator who stood on the floor who said, when we pass this law to allow a moment of silence, we will also be re-establishing prayer in our schools. Now, I don't know that that's the exact wording. I'm paraphrasing. That case, when it went before the U.S. Supreme Court, when that particular law that was passed was tried before the U.S. Supreme Court, an individual who now lives in the state of Utah by the name of Richard Wilkins was the individual who argued for the state of Louisiana. And they lost. They lost on the very thing that the Supreme Court had, recent, had previously said was appropriate to have a moment of silence. And the reason they lost is because this legislator said this will be considered establishing prayer in our schools in Louisiana. We need to remember that as I continue to discuss the uh, processes that we're dealing with now in the state of Utah because establishment is a very serious thing in the eyes of the courts. And in the eyes of the U.S. Supreme Court in that particular case, even a moment of silence because of the statement of that state legislator was considered as establishment of prayer. The next thing that happened that probably caused us all to wake up and, and uh, be a little more concerned was the attack on prayers at graduation. And once again, maybe that wasn't a big deal, maybe it was. But I've attended graduations with prayer and I've attended graduations without prayer since the decision has been made. And I will tell you that graduation from school 
at, from high school is, an, is a very important thing. And beginning with an acknowledgement of God, an acknowledgement and appreciation of the opportunity for that education solemnifies that occasion and makes it special. And when you can close that graduation experience with a prayer, it ends that experience again on a solemn note that gives it a special quality. Now I don't know if anything that we do in the state of Utah is going to regain that ability to say prayer and gradua graduation, but it might have helped to wake us up. But the great awakening in this state occurred when Salt Lake City was sued for offering a prayer at their city council meeting. Now once again, I need to take you back to what was happening on the national level, and we'll talk about the Salt Lake City case in just a minute. In 1990, there was a case called the Oregon Employment Division versus Smith. And some of you may remember that as the peyote decision because it involved a, an Indian who used peyote in a religious ceremony. And in some states, they even have laws that allows the use of peyote in Indian religious ceremonies because it is a part of their religious belief. But in this case, it had, it had something more than just to do with whether they allowed him to use the peyote. It had to do with his employment benefits. And I won't, I won't bore you with all the details, and quite honestly, I don't know all of the details, but I do understand the decision that was made. The decision by the U.S. Supreme Court on the national level again, when it arrived at that court, could have said that the state could control the situation by a compelling government interest, but they chose to go beyond that statement. They chose to say that a state could regulate religions. In fact, I'd like to read from the actual final decision, so the words that were stated in the uh, affirmative decision. It says, it may fairly be said that leaving accommodation to the political process, which means that the political process allowing legislatures now to legislate religious activity, will place at a relatively at a relative disadvantage those religious practices that are not widely engaged in. But that unavoidable consequence of democratic government must be preferred to a system in which each conscience is a law unto itself, or in which judges weigh the social importance of all laws against the centrality of all religious beliefs. What that says is that if you are a majority religion, and you have a majority of the legislators on your side, your religious beliefs will be protected. But if you happen to be a member of a minority religion, you're in jeopardy because that the political process could legislate laws that could prevent your ability to practice your religion as you choose. Now, in the state of Utah, many who are listening to this may be a part of a majority religion. However, even in just Salt Lake City, I believe the, the majority-minority situation has changed. But the important thing to remember is that all of us in some part of the world can be a minority. Although we have Buddhists in the state of Utah, and we have Buddhists on our advisory board, a, a, Buddhist, a Zen Buddhist on our advisory board, to try and provide input as to how he feels about the language that we're working on. Although they are very much in the minority in this country, there are many places in the world where a Buddhist, a Zen Buddhist, would be the majority religion. And religious freedom needs to protect the rights and the conscience of the minority as well as the majority. Unless, of course, there is a compelling government interest that would take precedent. And the amendment language which we have written does allow for reasonable compelling government interests to take precedence. I am going, on this side of the, the tape, I will continue to talk about the history and why we're concerned about it. On the other side, I will talk about the language and what we want to do about it. So if you'll bear with me, I won't spend too much time at this point talking about the language. But the Smith decision, as we just talked about, the Oregon uh, Employment Division versus Smith in 1990, the Smith de decision was a major reversal on the part of the U.S. Supreme Court in the protection of religious liberty. It basically said that religious rights no longer take precedence over other rights. They no longer are paramount of importance. 
On the national level, there has been an effort to try and undo the problems of that decision uh, with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And if the Religious Freedom Restoration Act passes, and it is currently before Congress, and I will tell you that our Utah congressmen and senators are working very hard for the passage of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. But if that passes, that will restore some of the religious freedom on the national level. And that is a very important thing. The next thing that occurred that in the, in the history of, of this whole process, as I mentioned earlier, was the suing of Salt Lake City for the holding of a prayer. And many people thought, oh, there's not a chance in the world that that'll ever be uh, upheld by a court because the U.S. Supreme Court had said that legislative bodies could open their meetings with prayer and they considered that Salt Lake City was a legislative body, etc. What they forgot to do in, in that thought process was to look at the Utah Constitution. And, as they and the Utah Constitution said no public money or property shall be appropriated for or applied to any religious worship, exercise, or instruction, or for the support of any ecclesiastical establishment. Now, Judge Fredericks, in making that decision, made the statement that no prior Utah Supreme Court cases have specifically interpreted the foregoing constitutional provision insofar as it relates to the exercise or allowance of prayers. But he went on to say that one of the principles, if not the first canon of statutory or constitutional construction, is that if the language of a statute or constitutional provision is clear and unambiguous, examination of legislative intent is unnecessary. I will tell you, though, that there are many people who have looked very hard to find some legislative intent for the particular reason that langu language was used, and they have found none. So we do not have any legislative intent to guide us in the interpretation of that language. But then Judge Fredericks goes on to say, in this instance, the constitutional provision in question is unambiguous and capable of ready interpretation. Again, he says, the language of the Utah Constitution sets forth the absolute law which governmental officials are bound to follow. And he says, by planning for and presenting public prayers as part of their opening ceremonies, the city council uses public prayers to aid and support the religious practice of prayer. The government prayer does involve, again, I'm speaking from Judge Fredericks, does involve the expenditure of public funds. The city council has spent time and money to develop guidelines for those offering invocations. The council members and city employees are paid to observe and be solemnized by these exercises. City employees must schedule and arrange for the attendance of the person offering prayer. Moreover, the facilities intended for use of the city are appropriated for the actual presentation of prayer. The Constitution of Utah, he says in, in uh, conclusion, dictates in clear and bold terms that religious exercise must be separate from the functions of government. At that point, I became aware that something is wrong. What is it about our Utah Constitution that says we cannot recognize God at the beginning of a public meeting? And so I began studying the language of our Constitution, the language of other state constitutions, and the uh, interpretations of the federal Constitution, which has brought me to this point. But the thing I have discovered in the process is we're not just dealing with prayer. There are many things that can be affected by this. In fact, I would like to quote from Michael Ballum, who is a Utah State University music professor. He said, this issue is not one just of prayer, but transcends to involve art and music in public instruction. Choral music, which represents the largest segment of musical instruction in our state, finds its basis in the masterworks of sacred music. And I will tell you that on a radio program not too long ago, uh, when one of the representatives of the ACLU was asked if sacred music would be appropriate in the choral uh, instruction in the state, the answer was, in fact, the person said, well, for example, 
uh, could you sing Ave Maria? This particular person was a Catholic faith and had lived in an area in the Chicago area where singing of Ave Maria was a standard part of the choral instruction. And the response was, no, that would not be appropriate because that's a prayer. Now, m much of the singing of sacred music is not necessarily prayer, but it could be considered religious instruction. And when you get involved with public funding, you, you get into a very dangerous area. Now, the next thing that happened on the federal level that again caused us a great deal of concern was the Wiseman decision. Many of you will recognize that as the Rhode Island decision that said we cannot have graduation prayer. The thing that was particularly concerning about that decision, and I will tell you at that point in this state, we had already initiated an initiative process asking people to sign initiatives, supporting language which we felt was constitutional at the time, asking the legislature to act, to put this measure on the 1992 ballot, to provide a safer Utah Constitution that would protect our religious liberties in this state. Um, in examining the Wiseman decision, I became even more concerned because the Wiseman decision basically stated, in fact, I'll read from it for you. The Wiseman decision said that state officials here direct the performance of a formal religious exercise at a secondary school's promotional and graduation ceremonies. Now, all we're talking about is the allowing of a rabbi to give an opening prayer, and they're calling it the directing of a formal religious exercise. It said, Lee's decision that prayer should be given and his selection of the religious participants are choices attributable to the state. Moreover, through the pamphlet and his advice that the prayers be non-sectarian, the effort was to try and make them non-offensive to those of dis different religions, he directed and controlled the prayer's content. That the directions may have been given in good faith attempt to make the prayers acceptable to most persons does not resolve the dilemma caused by the school's involvement. Since the government may not establish an official or civic religion as a means of avoiding the establishment of a religion with more specific creeds. What we gain from this language is a belief that if a publicly paid official, such as a school teacher or a school administrator, has anything to do with something of a religious nature, they can be accused of establishing religion, and the courts do not look kindly on the establishment of religion. Now the question comes, can you, in a state, allow greater protection than might be afforded by the U.S. Constitution? And that answer is an unequivocal yes. You talk to any constitutional attorney who understands constitutional law, and they will tell you that the Constitution clearly allows states to provide greater protection. The Constitution allows us to, to uh, put into detail what we mean by religious liberty so that it cannot be misconstrued by the courts. As in the case of Judge Fredericks when he made the decision in the lack of a clear description of what that language meant, he, he could interpret it as he saw it. What we want to do with the state of Utah's Constitution is to clearly define what religious liberty means and to give the maximum protection that is possible under the law to protect not just minority religions but man majority religions but minority religions as well that all people may have their religious liberty protected. I should tell you that my daughter <coughs> is uh, was in the Madrigals last year and the Madrigals of our high school, Murray High School, participated in attending many churches in the performance of sacred music. And that was a very special experience for these young people. It helped to build their character. They attended several different denominations, not just one particular, the, the, the predominant denomination in this state. And it was a very good experience for them. That could be challenged if we do not change our constitution. The singing of uh, Christmas songs, the observing of Christmas if it's considered a religious holiday by the schools, uh, the uh, pr police protection of churches, uh, the police protection of the 24th of July parade as I mentioned earlier. I mean you can go on and on at the parade of horribles that could happen in this state in the next two years if we do not do something. You need to realize that you can only place a constitutional amendment on the ballot in a general election. We have a general election coming up in November of 1992. 
once we pass September 3rd, which is the date when the language, if there is language passed by the legislature, must be, passed, must be placed in every newspaper in the state, throughout the state, in every county. Once we pass that date, there is nothing we as a people can do until November of 1994. In the meantime, those who oppose the mention of God or the uh, singing of sacred songs or the saying of prayers or the teaching of religious history or the allowing of students to leave the campus to go receive religious instruction such as a seminary program or a Bible study program. Any of those things may be eliminated in the next two years pro probably just by intimidation because I can't imagine that the ACLU or the Society of Separationists could call the school and just say these things are clearly illegal in the state of Utah. Why are you allowing them? And rather than the school spending the money in litigation, which would be necessary to try and save that practice, they probably would change because clearly the language is against us at the present time. We need to act now. We need to act this hour. What can you do? Write to the governor. Yesterday I met with the governor and the governor said, I'm not feeling any pressure on this issue. I don't feel that there's any concern among the people in this state over this issue. They clearly are willing to wait until a legislative session. To call a special session on, on a matter of this importance, you need to have major input from the people and from organizations and from uh, bodies. In fact, the League of Cities and Towns has come out in favor of a special session. Contacting your mayor and having him contact the governor. Letters to your legislators. Calls to your legislators. If there ever was a time when you're doing something now can make a major difference. It's today, this very hour. Then I would ask you, please, pass this tape on to someone else who might also be concerned about this issue and let them help pass the word. If each person would contact five other people and each one of those people would contact five other people, we could reach across this state and make a major difference. Otherwise, we will have to deal with whatever comes in 1994 and we will never be able to go back to what we have in August of 1992 and no one will be to blame but ourselves. I would like to close with a statement by Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln said in a proclamation to designate and set apart a day for national prayer, we have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God that made us. And then I would like to refer to a scripture. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if you will look at the next verse in Joshua, following the statement which I just quoted, he said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord. God forbid that we should forsake the Lord in the state of Utah. Let's welcome God in the state of Utah. Let's make this a place where religious freedom abounds and where people who want to flee from other states to have a place where they can worship freely and worship according to the dictates of their conscience can know that there is a safe haven in the state of Utah. Thank you for your help. Now, if you'll turn this tape over, I will deal with the specific language which has been prepared. I will try to give you some background. It will become, it will be more complicated in discussion, but those of you who want to understand the language to the extent that I understand it, I will help you.
I would like to start a discussion of this language by reading a letter from the Utah League of Cities and Towns. This was prepared August 11th, was addressed to Governor Norman Bangader. And it, for some of you who may be interested in writing a le letter to Governor Bangader, this may give you some ideas. Uh, the letter is addressed to Governor Norman Bangader, Utah State Capitol, Salt Lake City, 84114. And it states, Dear Governor Bangader, As you are aware, at the Utah League of Cities and Towns Mid-Year Conference in St. George, our membership unanimously adopted a resolution requesting you call a special session for the legislature to pass a constitutional amendment for prayer at city and town council meetings. This is most remarkable since our membership is so diverse politically and religiously. During the May special session, this issue was not placed on the agenda for a variety of reasons. At the League, however, this remains an issue of utmost concern. We still believe that a constitutional amendment is needed to resolve this issue. As a policy, the League has always supported the resolution of issues such as this at the legislative level rather than through the courts. Simply, it is the most economical and the fairest approach to policy creation. The prayer issue fits nicely into this situation. If the public prayer issue can be decided by a vote of the Utah citizenry on November 3rd, then a costly court fight can be avoided. This vote of the people is democracy at its finest. In conclusion, we at the League would encourage you to call a special session to have the legislature consider this amendment to the Constitution. You have our assurance that we will do all we can to see its adoption. And I would also tell you that as of today, uh, August 12th, the League of Cities and Towns is sending a letter to all legislators supporting the language which I will be discussing in the next few minutes. Uh, that has occurred their support of that language has occurred with some very careful negotiation. Now, the individual who was the major author of the language we will be discussing is Professor W. Cole Durham, Jr. About, uh, well, I think it's about three weeks ago, there was a major international meeting in Budapest, Hungary on religious liberty. And invited to that meeting were leaders of the various emerging countries, those countries who are trying to write constitutions that will allow for democracy. And it's a, it's a very difficult process for these countries who have lived in uh, totalitarian governments or under communism and who are now striving to prepare a, a democratic government. And W. Cole Durham, Jr., was an organizer of this conference and was a major part of helping people to understand how they could incorporate religious liberty language into their constitutions. He made a very interesting statement on returning home that it was strange that he should spend all this time with these countries in uh, Europe and in, the, in the, some of the Russian countries or previous Soviet Union countries and come home and find the problems that he found in the state of Utah. But he spent a week of his time in working on the language that we are dealing with. And this language did not just come off of the top of someone's head. It has been carefully researched. The research had gone on long before uh, Cole Durham even became involved. And the language that is in this amendment is language that has been tested in various cases before the Supreme Court. Most constitutional attorneys who read this language do not believe that it will even be tested because it is so clearly constitutional. Now that may, that may be, uh, turn out to be a, a false statement, but at least I have talked with attorneys who have said that. They feel that it is so, so very carefully drafted and so clearly uh, taken care of. Now I should tell you one other thing before we get into the language. There's another little glitch in this time process. Some of you may remember that there were some hearings back in uh, May. In fact, there was uh, one hearing and then there was a, an open meeting of a committee that had been called to deal with the religious liberty matter. And at that time, there was the belief that if the constitutional amendment wasn't passed by the legislature by June 5th, that it could not be placed on the 1992 ballot. 
And uh, I was involved in investigating the language in our code, which they were using to say that we had to have the process completed by June 5th. And there is a statement in the Utah Code that says that any measure which goes before the people needs to have the language submitted to the Lieutenant Governor's Office, I think it's 150 days prior to the general election, which they had considered to be June 5th. However, I will tell you that most of you are aware that there is a paramutual betting uh, measure that is going to be on the ballot in 1992. They didn't even have to turn in their petitions until in July. The reason why that particular part of the language was ignored for them, because it's my understanding that there was a change or there was a correction of the code that occurred in one of the recent legislative sessions, and they just overlooked that particular part of the code. They meant to change it, but it didn't get changed. And I feel that if there's already been an exception made for the paramutual betting measure, that there ought to be an exception made also for the constitutional amendment. In fact, the Constitution itself describes the terms by which you can amend the Constitution. And it states that 60 days prior to the general election, you must advertise in every newspaper in every county of the state the language so that the people are aware 60 days prior to the general election. I think at the time that we have a special election, we ought to bring our election code into compliance with our Constitution. As, as we all know, you can't just write a law in the code to change the Constitution, and so we ought to have the code agree with the Constitution, which would mean that uh, the language could be submitted for the voters' pamphlet at the same time as it is passed to be placed in the newspapers. That, that is just a bookkeeping matter that could be easily taken care of, and although that is one of the things that the governor has been concerned about, I think where there's already been an exception made for paramutual gambling uh, initiatives, certainly there could be a, an exception made for something as important as religious liberty. However, it probably won't happen unless the people speak up and say, look, we want to be recognized. We want to comply with the Constitution. We want to be able to place this matter on the ballot. If, if the people make their will known to the governor and to the legislature, I am sure they will act. And the question comes up next, again, before we get into this language, well, what kind of response are we having from the legislature? We have sufficient numbers in the, both the Senate and the House in support of doing something. Uh, there, I can't tell you at this particular moment that there is a united consensus on this particular language because this particular language has not been available for a long time. As, as you may have understood from uh, the discussion on the previous side, after the Wiseman case, the language which we had previously used on our initiative petition had to be redrafted because the Wiseman case rewrote how you interpret religious liberty once again. And in that rewriting of interpretation, there was, there was some of the language that was on the uh, initiative petition that needed to be changed. And in the process, we then were able to use Cole Durham to help us. Uh, he worked very closely with Representative Merrill Nelson, who has a lot of experience in this area also, Representative John Valentine, uh, Rep uh, Senator Lyle Hilliard, Senator Fred Finlinson, some excellent uh, legislators who have good constitutional backgrounds, as well as working with the Rutherford Institute, who uh, Protestant churches look to for guidance in these matters, and also Salt Lake City, uh, Roger Cutler, and the League of Cities and Towns. So this language was not drafted without careful consideration with many people who had valuable input. Now let's uh, go to the actual language. Now, for those of you who are interested in a very careful analysis of this language, it is available. Uh, commentary has been prepared by Cole Durham, W. Cole Durham, Jr., uh, Professor W. Cole Durham, Jr. I should give him the proper title. Um, and uh, I should point out that in the consideration by the courts of what this language means, the commentary which will eventually be accepted by the legislature is very critical in that interpretation. As I explained earlier, the original Constitution language that we have on religious liberty, uh, there is no commentary. There is nothing that indicates what was intended by that language. And so we're left completely 
to the discretion of the courts. But by creating commentary to go along with this language, we can establish a record which, when the language is being interpreted by the courts, they will have something to go to to say, this is what the legislature meant. And for those of you who would like a copy of that, you may write to the Coalition for Religious Liberty, uh, my address, 5141 Clover Meadow Drive, Murray, Utah, 84123. And if you could send a contribution, it would be greatly appreciated. We really are running on a shoestring. Uh, if anyone has a deep pocket that would really like to help us to um, succeed in this particular effort, we could really use your help. But even a dollar, even 50 cents, anything would be helpful. But we'll send you out a copy even if you just send an ask. If you do not have the ability to contribute to the cause, we'll still provide the information if you'll just write. All right. Uh, this particular uh, amendment is a revision of Article 1, Section 4 of the Utah Constitution. And it starts out with the statement, number one, religious liberty and toleration shall be secured as an inherent and inalienable right for all persons in the state of Utah. I will tell you that originally that wording was a preeminent right, but inherent and inalienable are the words that are used in other places in the Constitution. It's also the wording that is used in the language that was used to draft the um, abortion limitation code and so it was felt that rather than the potential of this being used as to to uh, secure by some people a, a perceived abortion right it was important that those two areas be in um, agreement so inherent and inalienable are the words that were used in the second paragraph the rights of conscience shall never be infringed that is already in our current constitution that language has been misunderstood by many. In fact, uh, at the hearings that were held in May, J.D. Williams said we need to change that because that's the very kind of thing that Lafferty is using to uh, say that he was his conscience told him he should murder someone and, and, and that this language could be used to give him the right to do that. Well, number one, murder is an area where it's a compelling government interest and government has the right to legislate um, against murder so that that couldn't be used for that purpose anyway but what has happened is in the preparing of the commentary conscience has been very clearly defined so that it is referring to the inner conscience the uh, the inner belief rather than outer actions and then language has been added which says every person has the right to worship according to the dictates of conscience that further describes again what we're talking about on outer action of conscience is worship not uh, doing just anything that one might think uh, they ought to do at the moment then uh, I should explain that in this particular amendment we have divided part of the Constitution that existed previously the federal Constitution basically says Congress shall make no law uh, respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And that language was in our Constitution, uh, is in our Constitution now, basically. One of the problems with the federal language is that it says no law respecting an establishment of religion. And the courts have interpreted that to mean any religious activity, not religion meaning a church uh, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Um, and so that we have what there's two parts of the federal um, religious freedom language the part that says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise the first part is the establishment part no law respecting an establishment of religion and the second part is prohibiting the free exercise thereof so in this amendment we have divided those two because in the considerations of the court they always make decisions based on either the establishment part of that clause or the free exercise part of that clause. So to make it clearer what the intent of the amendment is, those two areas have been divided. And in paragraph two, we deal with the free exercise part of uh, that statement. So although we've removed that language, if you'll notice down in four, paragraph four, that language 
basically has been added back in. But paragraph 2 deals with the free exercise part. And it says, Neither the state nor its political subdivision shall make any law or engage in any other action that infringes, prohibits, or otherwise burdens the free exercise of religion, including voluntary manifestations thereof in public or in private. Obviously, one type of a voluntary manifestation would be a prayer. Unless the free exercise interest affected is outweighed by a compelling governmental interest that cannot be furthered by reasonable, less restrictive means. And that word reasonable was requested by Salt Lake City Attorney to make sure that the courts understood that there are reasonable things which governments can do, but the intent is not to, uh, to remove the free, ex free exercise interest. Okay, number three, no person shall be denied any political right, privilege, or capacity on account of his or her religious beliefs or lack thereof. And in the commentary, it states that person means more than just an individual. It can mean a corporation, it can mean an organization, uh, it can mean any entity within the state shall, shall not be denied any political right, privilege, or capacity on account of his or her religious beliefs or lack thereof. That's, I believe, fairly self-explanatory if you have a, a specific religious belief. Now, the, the question always comes up when we discuss this in a, uh, a public setting. Well, what about the Satanists? Does this say that a, a Satanic organization will not be denied any political right, privilege, or capacity because of their belief in Satan? The truth of the matter is their personal belief, it probably cannot, we cannot legislate against their personal belief. If their personal belief in Satan gets them involved in, in animal sacrifice, in murder, or, or many of the things that tend to go along with that, that uh, religious belief, then there is a sufficient compelling government interest to take care of the, um, the problems that are created. But we have to protect that person's right to believe in their conscience what they believe just as much as we have to protect mine or your right to believe in your conscience what you believe. Uh, it's not, uh, it's one of, the, one of the things that isn't uh, necessarily uh, enjoyed in a democratic society that people do have the right to think and say things that maybe people don't like. But in a free society, we do have the right to have differences of opinion and to, and to disagree as long as we don't infringe upon the rights of others in a, in a matter that might uh, be covered under a compelling governmental interest. Okay, then the next section where it says no religious test shall be required as a qualification for any office of public trust. That's a, just left the same as before, and actually it doesn't even need to be there but it's left there just simply because we don't want to take it out and have someone try to question why it's there because it's covered in other parts of our uh, Utah code. Number four, there shall be no union of a church and the state. Um, union of church and state has really been misconstrued and there's a lot of people who are very concerned about religious freedom who are concerned about leaving that into our in our uh, Utah Constitution. They, they were concerned that leaving it in might state that our Constitution is saying that we want separation of church and state. But by inserting a church in front of church and the in front of state, we're saying that there can be no union of a church and the state. Like meaning no, if there's anything that, that appears as if uh, a particular denomination and the state of Utah has combined in a, in a union manner, that is prohibited by this Constitution. And then added, this language has been added to further describe that because the, the next part of that sentence, which has been deleted, was open for so many interpretations. And since this part of the Constitution has never been interpreted and we do not have anything that indicates what the, what the intent was when it was originally written, this next statement is intended to say what they believe the intent of the last half of that sentence was. Neither the state nor its political subdivision shall make any law or engage in any other action that constitutes the establishment of a religion. So that the state can do nothing that could constitute the establishment of a religion, specific religion, 
not just religious belief, but a religion. Then removed are the words, nor shall any church dominate the state or interfere with its functions. Now, this is a touchy area, and there are some Protestant religions who feel like that possibly removing that might allow uh, a predominant church to dominate in this state. Uh, now, my first reaction to that is, well, if we do nothing, uh, nothing has changed. If we, if we change the Constitution to make it very clear what we mean, we have a better chance of making sure that we, we never have a union of a church and the state. But on the, on the other side, I will tell you that there were some people who testified at the hearings that said that if you have a majority of members of the legislature representing a particular religion, that's domination, and that ought to be prohibited. And the people of the state of Utah need to be able to elect whoever they want to elect, regardless of religious preference. Religious preference should not enter in. Uh, you, you, uh, those legislators who legislate don't... They're not acting for a church. They're acting for the people who elected them. And it's the, it's the responsibility of the people to elect legislators who will properly represent them. And they, that ought not to be infringed. And that's the reason why that has been removed. And then we get into the statement that we talked about earlier. No public money or property shall be appropriated for or applied to any religious worship exercise or instruction and instruction is the area which scares me half to death because when you have public money involved in the schools and instruction is used whenever you get into religious instruction there's a potential for problem and quite frankly we need to do something to protect the students of this state so that they do not have to have God removed from their lives in a public setting we should Then in Section 5, probably that is the most important section from my perspective of this entire amendment because it defines what we really mean uh, and what religious liberty in the state of Utah means. And I want to once again assure you that this language is not language that was just drawn out of the air. This is language that has been taken from cases that have been tried before the U.S. Supreme Court, cases that have already been found to be constitutional, that this, these particular uh, ways of, of dealing with the various areas. And just to read it very quickly, to the fullest extent permissible under the Constitution of the United States, and that is critical because we're not asking for anything that isn't permissible under the Constitution of the United States. We're asking for the greatest protection that is allowable under the Constitution of the United States. And constitutional attorneys will readily tell you that we can have greater protection under the Constitution of the United States. But by inserting that language, we fend off potential challenges on constitutionality because we're saying we're just to the fullest extent permissible under the Constitution of the United States and in furtherance of the inherent and inalienable rights of persons in this state, this Constitution shall be construed to permit state or other action that A, publicly acknowledges or otherwise shows respect for religious or cultural traditions, practices, or beliefs. That will allow the singing of sacred music that has been uh, being sung for ages and it's, it's become a part of our culture. That will allow a discussion of our religious history uh, that will allow uh, those kinds of things that are that may acknowledge God, but that, are, that have been a part of our Utah culture for over 90 years. B. Solemnifies legislative sessions or other public gatherings with voluntary invocations, readings, meditations, or other similar acts. That allows the expression of religious faith in the forms of prayers or readings or meditations, whatever is appropriate for that particular religion to solemnify a public gathering if it is so chosen to do so. Uh, C. Affords reasonable exemptions or other accommodations to religious or cultural traditions, practices, or beliefs. That allows accommodation in some instances where, uh, for example, the Seventh-day Adventists believe in observing Saturday instead of Sunday uh, as their day of worship where uh, Jehovah Witnesses uh, do not believe in um, going to war 
and and I may not be describing that exactly right, but there are particular religious beliefs that there isn't any reason why we can't accommodate their religious beliefs, and it allows, through this language, to uh, afford reasonable exemptions. And then D allows religious persons or activities equal access to public facilities or public benefits that are provided or available to others on a non-discriminatory basis. It allows a ward to be able to schedule a, a public park and at the public park to be able to have a prayer, a ward or a, or a parish or a, a, any church to be able to have prayer at, at that public park if that park is also available to others who are non-religious on a non-discriminatory basis. It doesn't ask for any special privileges. It just asks to be able to be treated equally so that those who are non-religious don't have preference over those who are religious. And then the last one, no property qualification. Actually, that's, again, something that's covered also in another section of the code, and it probably isn't necessary, but it's just left there because it was there and we didn't want to take out anything that wasn't necessary. Section 2, it, it asks the lieutenant governor to submit this amendment to the electors in the next general election in the manner provided by law, and if approved by the voters of the state, the amendment proposed shall take effect on the date of voter approval. Now, if the governor calls a special session, I should tell you first, there will be public hearings. Again, this tape is being made August 12th, and I'm hoping that the public hearings will occur sometime within the next week, week and a half. Uh, the, obviously, the earlier the better if there is a chance for a special session. It's important that people such as you sign up to testify at these public hearings, to express your concerns. If you need help in understanding the law or having questions answered, please feel free to call. My number is 266-0076, and I know it's hard to get through to me. My phone rings constantly. But if you can get through to me, I get up early in the morning, and, I'm, and I'll take calls from 5 o'clock on. Uh, if you're having a difficult time reaching me and you want to prepare for testifying at one of these hearings, I'd be more than happy to help you, and I'm sure there's others in your area which we can get you in contact with that will help you in the preparation of a testimony. It's important that people who feel strongly about religious liberty testify at these hearings because the, the final conclusion of that committee as to whether we should hold a special session is going to have a major impact on that decision. Then once that committee has, has met and, and made their recommendation, then if the governor calls a special session, the legislature will need to meet. The legislature will then consider the language, and if the legislature passes the language by a two-thirds majority vote, and once again, contact of the legislators at that point is going to be critical. They need to hear from people who care about religious liberty. We don't want them saying, I don't feel any special uh, pressure on this issue. I don't feel anyone who is very concerned about this issue. If they do, they may, they'll, they will, they will likely respond to either who they feel the pressure from or, or just not uh, want to get involved in this political year. It is a political year, and some people don't want to get involved in an issue that may be controversial in a political year. So it's important to contact them and let them know your concerns. Then if the legislature passes it by that two-thirds majority, will then be on the ballot. I believe it's November 3rd. And that's not simple for a simple process either. Then we need to educate our neighbors. We need to educate one another so that when we go to the polls, we can cast an educated vote. And as long as people understand what they're voting for and the impact that it will have on the state, then the will of the people will be made known. Whatever the will of the people is, it will be made known. And my prayer is that it, they will understand what they are voting for, that it will not be something that they will cast in ignorance, but they will, they will realize the, the importance of this decision. But it will take all of us. None of us can do this alone. And it will take many of us. And we must reach out to thousands and thousands of people across this state if we are to be successful. And I pray that you will personally uh, analyze your life. Don't try to turn your life into chaos and, and uh, not take care of those normal responsibilities with your family and your job. But there must be some small thing that you can do to help this effort to be successful. And I pray that you will find out what that is and then participate to help this effort protect the children of the state of Utah for the future. Thank you.